Now the money power, including both the taxing and appropriating powers, and all other powers of the federal government are restricted by these enumerated limits. To prove then that any particular object belongs to the general welfare of the states of the Union, it is necessary to show that it is included within some one of the delegated powers, or necessary and proper to carry some one of them into effect before a tax can be levied or money appropriated. For Congress alone to, uh, to undertake to pronounce what does or was what does not belong to the general welfare without any reference to the delegated powers is to usurp the highest authority and one which belongs exclusively <coughs> to the people of the several states in their sovereign capacity. The counterattack. The nationalist construction of the Constitution advanced by Mr. Hamilton, strongly tended to concentrate all power of the government in the hands of the United States government. It therefore could not fail to excite alarm among those who were in favor of preserving the reserved rights and the federal character of the government. The counterattack was led by Washington's Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson became the leader of those in favor of the reserved powers, as they were called, the reserved rights of the states. Things remained in rough equipoise during the administration of General Washington. But shortly after the accession of his successor, the Elder Adams, the advocates of the reserved powers became a regularly organized political party in opposition to the Adams administration. This opposition assumed the name of the Republican Party. Its great object was to preserve and protect the reserve powers against the expansion of the delegated powers. The enactment of the Alien and Sedition Acts was the immediate cause of determined resistance. The passage of these two acts, especially the Sedition Act, caused deep opposition throughout the Union. The Sedition Act was generally viewed as intended to protect the government of the United States in its encroachments upon the reserve powers. The Sedition Act was assailed not only as unauthorized, but as a direct violation of the provision of the Constitution which prohibits Congress from making any law abridging freedom of speech or the press. In November of 1798, Virginia, seconded by Kentucky, a month later, led the opposition. In the Virginia legislature, a series of resolutions were passed, declaring the principle of states' rights and condemning the Alien and Sedition Acts and other measures of the government having a tendency to change the character from a federal to a national government. Among, among other things, the Virginia Resolves proclaimed the General Assembly, that is of Virginia, views the powers of the federal government as resulting from a compact to which the states are parties. First, as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact. And, second, as no further valid than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact and that in case of a deliberate and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by that compact, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. The General Assembly also expresses its deep regret that a spirit has been manifested by the federal government to enlarge its powers by a forced construction of the constitutional charter that defines them. And that indications have appeared of a design to expand the meaning of certain general phrases so as to destroy the meaning and effect of the particular enumeration, which necessarily explains and limits the general phrases so as to consolidate the states by degrees 
in one single sovereignty. The, the Kentucky resolutions, which emanated from the pen of Mr. Jefferson, are similar to those of Virginia. The Kentucky resolutions provided that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on a principle of unlimited submission to the general <laughs> government, but that by compact, under the style and title, the Constitution of the United States of America and amendments thereto, they, the several states, constituted a general government for special purposes and delegated to that government certain de definite powers, reserving for each state the residue. Jefferson went on to say that whenever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. That the government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to it, since it would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its power, but that in but that, as in all other cases of a compact among the parties, having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself, both as to the infractions and as to the mode and measure of redress. I think you can see where I'm going with this a bit pretty soon. You will be very, very shortly in any of it. Jefferson went on to say that the construction applied by the general government to those parts of the Constitution of the United States which delegate to Congress a power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imports, and excises, to pay the debts, and to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, and to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution those powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or any other department <laughs> goes to the destruction of all limits to the powers prescribed by the Constitution. The words meant, pardon me, that words meant by that instrument to be subsidiary only in the execution of the limited powers ought not be construed so as to give unlimited power to destroy the residue of the instrument. As above stated, the Virginia Resolve recognized that the states who are parties to the Constitution have a right and are duty-bound to interpose to arrest the progress of the evil. Along the same lines, Jefferson's Kentucky Resolves provided that, as in all other cases of compact among parties having no common judge, each party has a right to judge for itself, both as to the infractions and the mode and measure of redress. This right of the states to interpose and fashion the mode and measure of redress to protect their reserve powers from encroachments by the federal government in time came to be known as the doctrine of interposition or nullification. When Mr. Jefferson replaced Mr. Adams in the office of the presidency, the crisis created by the Alien and Sedition Acts ended as of its own terms because the, the term of the Alien and Sedition Act expired on March 3, 1801. Accordingly, for at least a short time, there was no further talk of interposition or nullification. As I pointed out earlier, nullification was next chanted by the New Englanders who opposed Jefferson's embargo of 1807, Madison's Non-Intercourse Act of 1809, and the War of 1812, which disrupted New England's commerce with Britain. Now, at the Hartford Convention of 1815, Northern delegates adopted the Federalist notions set forth in the Virginia and the Kentucky Resolves. As above stated, the War of 1812 had seen the birth of new manufacturing industries in the United States. Rather than go without, Americans began to manufacture the things they needed, but could no longer import from England. With the end of the war, British manufacturers once again began to export 
to America. At this time in history, the British were simply able, owing to lower manufacturing costs, to undersell their American competitors. These British imports threatened to flood out our infant manufacturing concerns. To ensure that British goods could not be sold in America at prices that would drive out American manufacturers, Congress enacted the Tariff of 1816. Over the next 12 years, growing Southern objections to the tariff were all but ignored. Indeed, with the passage of the Tariff of 1824, tariff rates were increased to the further detriment of the South. The Tariff of 1828, which has come to be known as the Tariff of Abominations, was in reality a devious Southern stratagem and intended to give the North a taste of its own medicine. It turned out to be a terrible Southern miscalculation, which exacerbated the distress of the South, and the scheme went as follows. A high tariff bill was laid before the House. It was co to contain not only a high general range of duties, but duties especially high on raw materials, which New England wanted to be low. The bill was designed to satisfy the protective demands of the western and middle states and at the same time be obnoxious to New England. The Jackson men of all shades, protectionists in the north, free traders in the south, were to unite in preventing any amendments so that no other bill could be introduced or voted on. When the final vote came, the Southern Jackson men were to turn around and vote against their own measure. It was believed New, the New England men and the Adams men in particular would be unable to swallow the high tariffs which affect, affected goods coming into New England and would vote against it. The combination of the Adams men and the Southern Jackson men would prevent its passage even though the Jackson men of the North might vote for it. The result expected was that no tariff bill at all would be passed during the session, which was the entire object of the southern wing of the, the Jacksonians. On the other hand, it was believed that the obloquy of defeating the bill would be cast upon Adams' party, 